if you invest the way people gamble mm -hmm. in casinos, yeah. you're not going to do very well. So it's the long-term investment yeah. that works best. And, but if you like the action mm -hmm. of investing, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, just like people like the action when they gamble in a casino, mm -hmm. those people are not my people. I like the long-term investors yeah. who figure out something that's going to work over the long term mm -hmm. and buy that. And the sooner the Chinese people gamble less and invest patiently for the long term more, the sooner they will do better. Okay. The world is full of foolish gamblers mm -hmm. and they will not do as well as the patient investors. Well, I think it can be learned to some extent and to some extent you're born with it. There's a saying in America they call a long attention span. Mm -hmm. They can keep their mind on a game or an activity for a long time until they've solved it. And the Chinese do have a long attention span. And that is a hugely desirable quality because you, you're more likely to get the right answer if you think deeply and hard about a subject for a long time. And it's odd that a group of people who are so good at having a long attention span like to gamble so much, which is quite counterproductive. A lot of people think there is such a thing as truth in the markets, mm -hmm. that the market is going to tell you something just by bouncing around. Mm -hmm. That is not the way Berkshire Hathaway or Charlie Munger invests money. Mm -hmm. We have a view as to what the intrinsic value is of what is being traded, and we only buy it when we think it's worth more than we're paying. So we're trying to make a long-term investment by waiting for something to be underpriced and then buying it. And we don't give a damn about all these gamblers in the market. To me, they're just so much froth. And, I, and it's, it's a foolish way to spend your time if you want to get rich. Well, the Chinese market is going to create a lot of successful investors. If you look at Hong Kong, which has been full of Chinese people enmeshed in a capitalist order with a good securities market. That is going to spread all over China and increase in respectability and size for decades ahead. I anticipate that China's security markets and investing practices will get better and better for a long, long time. There'll be fluctuations to be sure. But, but the long-term trend will be toward more achievement, more respectability, and higher prices. The Chinese who've gotten rich in Hong Kong over the last 50 years are not the short-term traders and the gamblers. It has been the long-term investors who sought out good long-term investments and stubbornly held them for long periods of time. And just as that worked for the Chinese in Hong Kong, it'll work for the Chinese on the mainland. It's not the short-term gambling that's good. It's the identifying the good long-term investment and sticking with it for a long time. My Berkshire Hathaway stock cost me $16 a share, and it's now selling for almost $300,000 a share. That's been a very good investment. It took a long time, and it was a long-term investment where I liked the people I was investing with and I liked the com companies I was investing in. And I just sat there for more than 50 years. And lo and behold, it's worked out very well. And there are lots of stories like that. Li Lu and I have been investing together in China for what, 13 years or so? Yeah, 15 years. 15 years. And we have bought a lot of securities and we sold very few. I have not made very many bad investments. It, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. they've been small and not very many. Yeah. I don't have many bad investments. Neither does Li Lu. Basically, the Mungers have three stocks, mm -hmm. so, so to speak. We've got Berkshire, we've got Costco, mm -hmm. and we have an investment in Li Lu's partnership. Yeah. <laughs> three things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm well along in my 95th year. Mm -hmm. Three things. You don't need to own a lot of different things to get rich. The New York Times just interviewed and they asked me, why are these people 
in China so interested in Berkshire Hathaway and Charlie Munger. I know, it's very peculiar. 25%. <laughs> it's very peculiar. It is very peculiar. P partly the book did it, but why do the Chinese like that book? I think the answer is that it sounds Confucian. China has a deep Confucian ethos. They want people to act modestly even though they're rich and powerful. They want people to constantly keep learning and to behave with dignity and reason and, and improve as they get old and keep working. Well, those lessons are not confined to one country. But it just happens that Warren Buffett and I act like a bunch of people that take Confucianism very seriously. That's why they like us. Oh, people, they know I like books. So people give me so many books that I either skim or read through 20 books a week. <laughs> no, I, I get lots of books. I read a lot of biography and some history. I read almost no fiction. You said, he asked me what other reason yeah. for the reason that we're suddenly popular in China? Yeah. And I said, there's one more reason, is that Warren and I really like the Chinese. And of course, everybody likes people who like them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's what happens. Now you say, why have the Chinese gotten so popular with a couple of Omaha boys? That's something that a lot of Chinese don't understand. If you look at China with the viewpoint of a United States citizen, here is what you see. When the Chinese first came in here, we were trying to build the Sierra, the Transcontinental Railroad in the winter through horrible passes in the steep mountains. And nobody could do it. It was impossible. People were dying and they just, it was just too hard. So they brought in like 50,000 Chinese coolies who were in those days practically slaves. And they took those coolies up into the mountains in the winter and they said, you build a railroad. And they did. And, and the Americans couldn't do it by themselves. Well, that of course made a very favorable impression. Well, fade in, fade out. And now we've had all this immigration of Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, so on. And what have those Asians done in America? Well, they've come in and rapidly become doctors, lawyers, professors, businessmen, and so forth, and succeeded mightily. And if we go to our symphony orchestra, which didn't used to have any Chinese in it, every instrument that's hard to play and takes unlimited practice, you look up from the instrument, there's a Chinese face. Well, of course, we find people popular who are succeeding so much in our country and they're not causing a lot of trouble. They're just succeeding. And so naturally we like the Chinese. And I don't think the ordinary person on mainland China understands what an image of success China has in the United States because the Chinese Americans have done so well here. And the most extreme thing of all that nobody could have anticipated Nobody ever talks about it, and you should talk about it in your magazine. It's because there was so much poverty in China, and it was so overpopulated. If an American couple were unable to have children of their own, they could always go to China and adopt a Chinese girl from a very poor family. So in every important city of America, people soon learned they got better babies, taking the unwanted Chinese girls from the remote Chinese farms, that those babies on average worked out better than if had their own children. And so everybody wanted to adopt a child. They don't want an American child. They want a Chinese girl. And of course, all those girls worked out well. And most people in China don't realize how extreme that's been. That's happened in every American city, every American private school, is full of the discarded Chinese girls from the Chinese countryside and they're getting all A's and winning the prizes. And of course it makes a favorable impression.
and <laughs> and, and you should write about it because yeah. every city is full of these adopted Chinese girls being raised by American families, yeah. and they're spectacularly successful, yeah. even though they come from a background of poverty. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's just dramatic, and it's all over America. Yeah. You in northern Minnesota, there are these Chinese girls, yeah. and they're playing the the difficult instruments in the orchestra. So from your perspective, uh, where is Chinese security market today? It is like the 73, 74, 82. Where is it now? Uh, how do you really see the current stage of the security market? They wanted both of us to answer, so you'll go first. <laughs> I think there's more value for the, for the investor in the, if you buy the best companies in China, or the best companies in the United States. I think that at current prices, the best companies in China are selling cheaper than the best companies in the United States. The Chinese don't have to go abroad to find good investments. They've got plenty right in their own country. It's, it's a, there's some awfully strong companies in China that are selling at reasonable prices. China is opening up more and more to foreign investors and its markets are getting stronger and stronger with more participation from the world outside of China. That's all to the good. And <laughs> eventually it'll drive some prices up in China. I would argue that rationality, which is seeing the world the way it is instead of the way you hope it is, I'd say that's the most important. If you don't see the world the way it is, it's like, judging something through a distorted lens. You think the world is one way and it's, it's different. And of course, that leads to terrible mistakes. You want to think correctly. Well, you've got to work at it and you've got to care about it. If you don't care whether you're rational or not, and you don't work on it, then you can just stay as irrational as you want all your life and take the lousy results you're sure to get. I carry it further and it's basically a Confucian attitude, I think you have a moral duty to become as rational as you can. You work at it all your life and you read a lot. Well, let me take it. Human nature in a big bureaucracy makes bad decisions. If you don't know that human nature in a big bureaucracy is gonna make bad decisions, you may give more respect to those decisions than they deserve. So it helps to understand where human nature is automatically causing bad results so you can avoid them. Well, you, anything that enables you to, to predict and adjust to reality, the reality is if you're dealing with a big dumb bureaucracy, it's very difficult and unpleasant. And the sooner you learn that and how to handle it, the better off you are. Those are just out of the introductory course in psychology in every university. <laughs> That's right. People don't learn. They teach it in the university and nobody pays any attention. <laughs> Let's take a simple question. As I said in that book, they offered me 300 shares of Bell Ridge Oil, yeah. which I bought because I had the money on hand. Yeah. Then they offered 1,500 more at the same price. Yeah. And now I had to sell something or borrow the money. Yeah. Yeah. And so I bought the 300 and not the 1500. Well, that decision has cost me now about $5 billion. I'd be $5 billion richer if I'd bought the other 1500. It's the contrast. It didn't inconvenience me in any way to buy the 300 and it inconvenienced me. And just the extra contrast made my judgment go sour. And it was the dumbest goddamn decision. One of the dumbest investment decisions I ever made in my whole life. And it was just came from a simple the stock was not overpriced because it was a little more inconvenient for me to buy it. But the inconvenience was enough to trigger my mind. And there was another problem on that. It was even worse. The man who dominated that corporation was eccentric and heavy drinking. And, but the oil field wasn't drinking. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I had two different psychological reasons why I made the wrong decision. I thought too much about how much the man was drinking yeah. and too little about how good the oil field was. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and then I thought too much about my own inconvenience and too little about the basic situation. So I screwed up 
fairly well. But that should encourage you people. Yeah. You can blow them one of your, the major opportunities of your life and yeah. st still muddle through all right. Think of the people who have an utterly miserable first mar marriage and a wonderful second marriage. Just all kinds of things get fixed. If you keep making something more and more valuable, mm -hmm. some wise person is going to notice it and start buying it. And so it's quite natural for things to be regarded as more valuable when they become more valuable. And, you know, if you want to buy a brand new automobile, say a Chevy, it costs X. And if you buy one 10 years old, it costs maybe a third of X. Everybody knows that the new Chevy is worth more than the one that's 10 years old. So pe people will recognize value in time. Crazy stock traders may do crazy things on the short-term basis, but over time, value will tend to win. Suppose we'd done nothing at Berkshire but pile up money from investing in stocks. And pretty soon, let's assume we started with 100,000 and pretty soon we had 10 million. People would notice that we had 10 million and the stock was worth more. It's natural for stocks to eventually go to value. But Ben Graham says in the short term, it's a gambling machine, the, the stock market. But in the long term, it's a vote. It's a weighing machine. In the long term, the market will figure out what's really worth it. Well, the beauty of it is that it keeps working when you're not. A great company will eventually earn more and more and more while you're just sitting doing nothing. And a mediocre company won't do that. So you're harnessing a long range for Long, long range force that will help you. It's just very important. These mediocre companies that are, they by and large are gonna cause a lot of agony and very modest profits. And if you do find it goes up a little, you have to sell it, you have to find another. It's a lot of work. But as you just buy one great company, if you get it the right thing at the right price, you just sit there. Well, when you say leverage, we use a little leverage because we've got the insurance float and so on. So we have worked with a little bit of leverage into our, but it's, it's, it's safe leverage. Mm -hmm. Nobody can call those loans or get nervous and sell our securities or something. But we use a little bit of leverage, but not much. And we don't ever borrow against our securities. We have 100%. Of course I would. If you give me 100%, you'd be out of your mind not to. You can't lose. You've, by definition, of course, you'd use all the leverage over the same. Nothing is 100%. Yeah, that's, well, nothing is. But suppose I use this example. Suppose you have a childless rich uncle, and he has a huge enterprise, enormously valuable, growing, getting more valuable. And he says, come into my business. I'll make you my heir, and you will inherit this wonderful big business. You've just been offered a sure thing. Why would you do anything else? You, you'd double down on the sure thing. Of course you would. That fortune's formula that came out of those people that beat the Hong Kong racetrack out of $100,000 a week for many years. And, but that was their formula. You can't bet too much in the Hong Kong, you'll change the odds. That's the way a racetrack works. But they bet more when they were sure and less when they were less sure. Berkshire has had great difficulty finding investments in the American markets that were low priced enough so we thought that they were very good investments. And finally, we found a few and so they're a little different. After all, you can argue that Apple is a consumer electronics company, and Warren said he could understand consumer electronics better than he can understand computer science. And so that explains the Apple performance. So, and besides, there's another reason why we're doing it. You have to keep learning if you want to be a good investor. And so, as we've kept learning and as conditions have changed, our investments have changed. Well. The only thing we've announced we've invested in is Apple. I, I think that what Warren said was he understands Apple better than those other companies. We, aren't, we don't know everything. 
and so we invest in whatever we can find with our abilities that seems to us to offer good value. And, and of course, that sometimes cause a, causes an odd mix. If some, a look at the airline investment. We have joked for decades about airline investment as being terrible for the shareholders who make airline investments. And all of a sudden, we buy stock in practically every airline. The stock they just pounded down. They were so cheap and so powerful. And the conditions had changed a little, and we were willing to own some airline stocks. We changed. We changed because the world changed. Warren and I hated railroad stocks for decades. But the world changed, and pretty soon we got down to only four big railroads. And technology changed. The shipping to the Orient got important. The whole world changed. And then we bought railroad stock, and then we bought a whole railroad. We changed our mind because the facts changed. Don't you change your minds when the facts change? If you're a better person, <coughs> you're likely to be a better investor. And if you're a wiser person, you're likely to be a better investor. What's not to like in Confucianism? Now, he was speaking a long time ago, 2,500 years a long time ago. The world has found out a lot of things Confucius didn't know. But his basic attitude is pretty damn civilized. If you analyze who lives a long life, professors, judges, value investors, who lives a short life, journalists, <laughs> hard drinkers, hard smokers. <laughs> it's, it's not very hard to know what to avoid. <laughs> well, you're talking to a journalist, Charlie. <laughs> I know, but in America, the journalists tended to smoke a lot and drink a lot and have a lot of deadlines, so always under stress, and they died young. And the judge just sits there. The court rules, goes at his pace, not somebody else's. There's nobody over him telling him to do something. The judge lives forever. And the trial lawyers, they die young too. Yeah, it, it, a lot of stress, a lot of problems. They really kind of what? Have, well, the traders have to really. And traders are the worst of all. The short-term stock traders die the quickest. They drink and they smoke and they. Yeah. They're tortured by. You <laughs> 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 describe perfectly the life of the journalist. Great <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, uh, <laughs> But, it, but uh, she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke. So you <laughs> live long. <laughs> well, Warren and I don't meet so much anymore. We talk on the phone. We don't talk as much as we used to. And. And, uh, but the one thing's the same. 30 people in Berkshire headquarters, Berkshire added $65 billion to its net worth last year. Guess how many people it added to headquarters? Zero.